Okay, chapter 11. We are going to continue the discussion of pure competition, except now we are going to look at a purely competitive firm in the long run. Okay, so the long run is a time period that is long enough where firms can increase or decrease their capacity and also where firms, new firms can enter the industry or existing firms can exit the industry. And when we talk about capacity, we're talking about their ability to produce goods and service. So if they increase capacity, then they are increasing, for example, their plant size or acquiring new equipment, or if they're decreasing their capacity, then they are downsizing their plant size, their plant size or selling off equipment that is not being used. Okay, to look at profit maximization in the long run, we're going to make a few assumptions. The first assumption is that entry and exit are easy for firms, so it is very easy for new firms to enter the industry in the long run, and it is easy for existing firms to exit the industry in the long run. We're also going to ignore short-run adjustments just so we can look at the effects of long-run adjustments. Also, the firms have identical costs. Since these firms are uh, selling an identical product, we're going to assume that their costs are also identical and that we are in a constant cost industry. So the entry or exit of firms does not affect resource prices and does not affect the cost of production of individual firms. And we will look at different cost industries um, later on in this chapter, but for now we're going to start with a constant cost industry. Okay, in the long run, production will occur at a firm's minimum average total cost, so price will also equal minimum average total cost. So there will be zero economic profits. Now, remember... Economic profits is not the same as accounting profits. Economic profits can be zero, but accounting profits can still be positive in the long run. Okay. And the reason why in the long run, you know, price will equal minimum average total cost is because of free entry and exit. So if in the short run firms are earning positive economic profits, then this will attract new firms to enter the industry in the long run. But as new firms enter the industry, supply will increase and this will bring price back down to, uh, to equal minimum average total cost. And if in the short run, firms are experiencing an economic loss, then firms exit the industry and supply will uh, decrease and this will bring price back up to the minimum average total cost. And we'll look at this in graphs. Okay. So long story short, in the long run, from the short run to the long run, new firms that are entering the industry in the long run, supply will increase, price will fall. And firms that exit the industry will decrease supply and price will rise back up. And so in the long run equilibrium, price equals minimum average total cost and there are zero economic profits. Okay, so let's say here in the short run that demand for the product increases so we have a shift to the right in the demand curve. Okay. And what ends up happening is that price increases. And it should be 50 here. Okay. To the new equilibrium of 60. Okay. So we have 50 here. And our price is at the new equilibrium of 60. 
So, remember price is over here now. Average total cost at this output is 50. So we have positive economic profit. Okay. over here okay but what ends up happening is that in the long run okay, since these firms are earning positive economic profit in the long run new firms will want to enter the industry so supply shifts to the right And this will bring the equilibrium price back down to 50. Okay. And economic profit is eliminated and we are at break even. Okay. And here we can show how an exit will eliminate a loss. So let's say demand... Um, for the product decreases and shifts to the left. Okay, so price goes from an equilibrium of 50 down to 40. Okay, and so now Okay, average total cost is 50. So average total cost per unit is 50, but the price or marginal revenue per unit is 40. So we are operating at a loss here. Okay, because each unit that is produced costs $10 more than the revenue it is bringing in. Okay, so in the long run, what would happen is that these is that firms experiencing losses would exit the industry, supply would decrease, this would cause an increase in the price back up to 50. Okay, and we are now at the point where we are break even and economic profit is zero. Okay, in a constant cost industry, um, the resource prices stay constant. Entry of new firms or exit of existing firms does not affect the long run average total cost. You know, the only time this case could be plausible is in an industry where the demand for resources is small in relation to the total demand of resources. So if they're demanding, let's say, corn, and there's a billion tons of corn produced, and let's say this industry only um, demands 10,000 tons of corn, you know, it's not enough to really affect the resource price of corn, for example. And in an increasing cost industry, okay, this is most industries, and that's you know, with entry of existing firms, long run average total cost increases because it creates more demand for resources and which then drives up the cost for these resources. And in a decreasing cost industry, um, as new firms enter the industry, uh, resource prices actually fall. Um, the example for this would be any industry where the resource is technology. Usually um, when there's a greater demand for technology, um, then the production of technology will experience economies of scale. So for example, uh, hard drives, computer chips, monitors, etc. You know, these type of resources um, benefit from large production because economies of scale are realized. So in a constant cost industry, increased demand um, for the output uh, does not 
change the price. Supply is horizontal. Since price of the resources stay the same, then the price of the output stays the same. And so whether demand for output is at 90,000 units or at 110,000 units, okay, price will stay at $50. Okay, so in an increasing cost industry, the increased demand for additional output will attract new firms in the industry, and so this results in resource prices increasing as well, and so firms will supply increased output but at higher prices in order to recoup the increasing costs of resource prices. So we can see here when demand's Q3 at 90,000, price is 45, but as demand increases, so does price. In a decreasing cost industry, this is an industry where resources experience uh, economies of scale when there's more demand for them. And so here, as demand increases for the good, new uh, firms enter the industry. Since resources are decreasing in cost due to economies of scale, then the increase demand okay, causes a drop in output prices because input prices or input costs are also decreasing. So at Q3 at 90,000 units, price is 55, but at 110,000 units, price is only 45. Okay, in the long run, uh, productive efficiency is achieved where price equals minimum average total cost. Productive efficiency is when goods are produced in the least costly way. So when average total cost of each good produced is minimized, we have reached productive efficiency. Allocative efficiency is when consumer surplus and producer surplus are maximized and increasing or decreasing production would not increase surplus any further. Okay, so we have here, okay, equilibrium, marginal cost equals marginal revenue equals price equals minimum average total cost over here, okay? And so if this is for the single firm, so when we look at the market for that good, okay, this is equilibrium over here, where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. And we see here that consumer surplus is maximized. Producing at a quantity lower than QE would reduce total surplus and producing at a quantity higher than QE would also reduce total surplus. And we see also that producer surplus is maximized. So total surplus is maximized when the firm is producing at price equals minimum average total cost. In other words, when the firm is at its productive efficiency, then it is also at its allocative efficiency. Okay. Firms in purely competitive market structures will adjust to changes in consumer taste, research supplies, and technology um, fairly quickly. You know, if consumers decide, you know, they don't want soybeans anymore as much, but they rather have, let's say, for example, corn, then, you know, in the short run, the demand for corn will raise prices, but in the long run, new firms can enter the industry and produce more corn, and this will help drive back down the price. Also, if there's a change in resource supplies, you know, if the change causes an increase in cost, then firms 
that are realizing a loss will exit in the long run, bring it back to equilibrium, or if it's reducing the cost, for example, if it's a new technology and it's reducing cost, then um, in the long run, new firms will enter the industry and it will bring economic profits back to zero. In other words, the invisible hand is here and market forces will, will bring profits back to equilibrium in the long run. So the goal of firms is to maximize profit and you know firms are always in a search in new ways to decrease their costs and help increase output. And a competitive market structure gives incentive to firms to innovate. Um, you know, gives them an incentive to find new ways to decrease their costs and develop new technology in order to be able to do so. Whereas if let's say there was just one firm producing soybeans um, and they weren't facing any competition from other firms, then there wouldn't be as much incentive for that firm to spend money to try to find new ways to decrease their costs in the long run. They could just be able to charge whatever price they were to recoup existing costs. And these new innovations lead to what we call creative destruction. And so the new innovations make the old technology obsolete. And so firms that are still stuck using the old technology are more likely to fail because their costs are higher. And the firms that are entering the industry either adapt to the new technology or they find ways to innovate and create even better technology. Okay, a patent gives the inventor exclusive rights to the good for about 20 years. So basically, the inventor has a monopoly on that good. And critics of patents will say this hinders innovation since there's no competition. And so they argue that patents on complicated products that are hard to copy should be eliminated. Such as, for example, the iPhone or a Mac computer. It's hard to make an exact replica of that. And in trying to replicate, they can discover new technology. And then, but they argue that on easier to copy products such as pharmaceuticals and patents should um, remain because if they were to expire quickly, then the pharmaceutical wouldn't have as much of an incentive to spend a lot of money on research and development because it's very costly to come up with a new drug. And so they want to be able to recoup that cost and have a profit. So. You know, if the patent only lasted a year and generics came in the market, then, you know, they wouldn't be able to make as much money off that drug. But overall, the argument against patents is that since patents give the inventor exclusive rights to their good, it destroys competition and therefore hinders innovation. And so, you know, decreasing the patent term or even not allowing certain goods to have patents will have the reverse effect. It will encourage innovation and creative destruction. All right, this concludes chapter 11.